pressed the button. It is preparing to stream. Setting up, you know, it always takes longer than you expect it to. But we're on our way to YouTube right now. <laughs> all right. It is preparing. Hello to all of those who are watching on YouTube, whether you're watching live with us right now or visiting us afterwards. I'm very excited for everyone to be here. Um, and right now, to officially get things started, I will turn it over to Allison. Hey, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. We have an exciting program with Marie leading us tonight, so we're excited about that. We wanted to give you some site updates. We have quite a bit to share, so I will not take up a lot of time, but do want to share some big things that we've been working on. Last week, we had our monthly board meeting, and we approved quite a bit as an organization. One of the main things we approved was our new strategic master plan, which is a very exciting document. Um, this is a project that uh, we started back in 2019 before COVID. Our board chair, myself, and our consultant went to a series of sustainability workshops and talked about how do we make a sustainable organization, not only in terms of programming, but also in terms of fundraising and making sure that everything we do is fundraised for and fiscally responsible. We also talked about, you know, we've been here for over 175 years. We want to be here at least for another 175. And so that kicked off a whole strategic plan project. And what this strategic master plan does is it takes the master plan that was created back in 1999. That was a process that involved staff, board, and community stakeholders and set the course for what the next few years would look like. That master plan is set to sunset in 2024. When I started six years ago, believe it or not, one of my main mandates was to how do we make sure that that plan that was created in 1999 continued on moving forward. So this strategic master plan takes all of the work and all of the projects that were outlined in that master plan. We have included those, updated them, added, of course, some new ones. And we now have a strategic master plan that guides the next seven to 10 years. All of the work that was done in 1999 is incorporated into this strategic master plan. And it's a very exciting document. What it also has for us is we do have a new vision statement, which is to cultivate an inclusive and sustainable world by exploring the historic connections between people and Rancho Los Cerritos. We have a new mission statement which is to honor diverse perspectives, enrich collaborative conversations, and inspire broader understanding through stewardship of Rancho Los Cerritos' natural and cultural history. So the vision statement is built, meant to be very aspirational, and it is, and the mission statement is how we get that done. One of the exciting things with this strategic master plan is we added what may seem a very simple word, but it's not one that we've used a lot in context of the rancho, and that's natural. So we have focused so much on the house, and rightly so, but we do have five acres. And so we need to focus on both the house and the gardens. The other thing this strategic master plan does is it doesn't limit us to telling the stories about our five acres that we all come to love and know, but it broadens the perspective so we can incorporate the 27,000 acres that the Rancho was part of. So that enables us to tell a lot more diverse stories and to add to the stories that we tell. It also rests on three values, which is to be relevant, to be responsive, and to be resourceful. Um, what those means are that we have diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility written throughout the strategic plan. We are relevant to the community and the stories that we're telling. And then we're also being resourceful in making sure that everything we do in our future is fundable. So that's really exciting stuff. We're excited to have it. The strategic master plan does rest on four intertwined pillars, which are preservation, innovation, education, and stewardship. And then within each of those pillars, there are goals and objectives with action steps that I'd like to consider are more projects 
to have measurable outcomes. It is a public document. It is 42 pages. There is an executive summary. So for anyone that would like it and wants to talk more about it, happy to share. Definitely will send the executive summary along with a timeline about how we're going to get all of these projects done. But it's super exciting. That was approved by the board. And this is a living document. So what that means is each year it will be analyzed in accordance with our annual budget. So we always make sure the budget is driven by the, by the strategic master plan and that the strategic master plan is driven by the budget. So they work in conjunction. So there will be adjustments to it, but this is, this is great. It guides our next seven to 10 years. And yes, for those that have asked, the barn that we've talked about for many years is included. And we are set to, you know, ambitiously, fingers crossed, start construction of that in 2030. I am sure the fundraising team is looking at me aghast, but that is an ambitious plan. We'll see how we can make it happen. Um, the other things that we are doing is, as many of you know, we do, we do have a stormwater retention and reuse project looking back to advance forward. And last Thursday, we approved the largest grant this institution has ever received, $2.1 million. We thought $1.1 million was amazing several years ago, but we went to 2.1. And so that enables us to complete the construction of the project, which is done in phase three phases. Phase one and two are on site. Phase three involves the lower parking lot. We are using a company called Griffith Construction, and they will begin pre-mobilization this year. So this project is really happening. The other thing we approved is our new exhibit, the Roots of Long Beach or Roots of Southern California. And this will take place in the upper level of the visitor center. Yes, again, we are closing the visitor center, this time not because of COVID, but for construction. So in mid-November, the visitor center will close. The entire upper space will become the exhibit, and this will be a changing exhibit gallery. Eventually, it will include the permanent exhibit, so that's not gone. It's just being looked at and revised a bit. Laura's office will become the museum shop. So the idea is, if you look at the visitor center, you enter in the left door, you're oriented to the video, to the site, the history, the space, walk through the exhibit, you lead to the right door, having passed what through? Museum shop, purchasing museum product, memorabilia, so you remember where you've been. And then of course, you're gonna take a tour, the house, garden, or both. So it incorporates the visitor center more into the site. Laura will still be at the visitor center. She'll be on the lower level, but she does have a rolling desk that will be on the upper level. So she's still very accessible. Um, so we're excited about this, having a new museum shop, new change in the exhibits. Um, and hopefully if you haven't already, we obviously brought on a new curator, Carlos Ortega. Right now he is immersing the exhibit, but he is looking to connect more with volunteers and volunteer projects. So as we move further into this, we will be connecting Carlos much more closely with the volunteers. I also want to put a shout out to Laura for organizing our volunteer appreciation dinner. You may not think it was quite a feat, but after being a year totally homebound, we were able to get together at the reef for an absolutely beautiful, wonderful evening. Um, it was great to see so many volunteers, staff and board members there to connect and to honor our Sarah Bixby Award winners and also our ABCD winners from 2020 um, and before. So that was super exciting. Thank you, Tessa, for becoming a crack photographer, taking photos. Um, it was great. We have all those in quick notes now and can share them. So thanks for stepping into that role. There's just so much to celebrate and value at the Rand Show. It's really an exciting time, always has been, but 
with the strategic master plan, the new exhibit and museum shop, looking back to advance forward, got a lot of big, big moves um, in store for the Rancho. So that's super exciting. I guess on a little bit of a bittersweet note, uh, Krista, as many of you may know, is our, was our PR marketing, marketing and PR manager. She has moved on to a new endeavor in San Pedro. So we're sorry to see her go. Really excited for Krista. We are looking at what does marketing look like at the ranch show? Who do we bring in next? So while that is a open conversation, we are looking at what that looks like. So she will be missed, but we're excited. And it gives us an opportunity to kind of reconfigure what marketing looks like at the ranch show. So it's an exciting time. Great things. Now, I'm super excited to turn it over to Marie because I've seen the butterfly handout that's been created. So I want to hear more. So Marie. Welcome. What we're going to do is we're going to ask you to, if you have questions, um, please type them into the chat or through the Q&A uh, option. And I will address them at the end so that I make sure I am staying within my allotted time. Um, <clears throat> so, butterflies evolved from nocturnal moths, and moths show up 300 million years ago. About 240 million years ago, moths' mouth parts began to shift from chewing to developing a tube that they could siphon soluble liquids, liquids through. Today, 99% of butterflies and moths have the coiled proboscis. Scientists once thought that the Cretaceous period with the development of flowering plants forced the changes in butterflies. But in 2014, the scientific community was shaken to the core. This is exciting stuff, people. Fossilized butterfly scales were discovered predating the earliest fossilized of it, predating the earliest flowering plants. What did those Lepteroptera consume in place of nectar? They fed on sap, resin, scat, and minerals from puddles. It is now thought that their behavior triggered the plant's response into developing nectar producing flowers. After all, a nectaring insect, butterfly, beetle, or bee, benefits the plant by shifting pollen as it delves into the flowers. Nocturnal moths will fly to white and fragrant flowers, but there was a bounty of blooms to explore once the sun came up. The shift from nocturnal to diurnal is thought to be food driven and butterflies adapted. The color percept their color perception is far better than a bee and a human. They can see red, whereas a bee cannot, as well as the ultraviolet light responses incorporated into many nectar guides, directing them to their sweet goal in the flower. The butterfly evolution is a bit murky, as few have been fossilized. Looking at this 40 million year old discovery from Colorado, it is quite similar to the ones that flutter by today. And now that they're in the sun, to attract a mate, they need to shine bright. Their wings are made of chitin, supported by veins, and are covered in scales. The scales repel water and are so lightweight that they float. So a dead butterfly is unlikely to sink into the mud, and hence there are so few fossils. Genes determine the color of each scale and that color acts as both camouflage and a tool to attract a mate. But the daylight also means predators could see them. Some butterflies color denote a warning to potential diners that they are poisonous. Others flat out lie, mimicking the color and even the flight pattern of their toxic brethren in an attempt to trick the birds. But how did they become toxic to begin with? While moths were still chewing on plants, the plants 
had to develop a method of protecting itself. By tasting bad and even becoming toxic, the predation from moths slowed all but to a stop. Um, <clears throat> however, a select few butterflies actually developed a tolerance for the toxins and various plants produce toxins. It wasn't just one, multiple plants do this. Plant colonies can survive the incursions of a select few and a balance was struck. As a bonus to the butterflies, birds that need caterpillars for survival found out that these select few caterpillars and the butterflies both were now toxic. Those very hungry caterpillars lose their mandibles in the chrysalis. Two partial tubes are aligned and locked together, rather like a zipper. But instead of lying flat, it forms a tube that is a, a cross between a sponge and a straw. As needed, this tube or proboscis can separate to and be realigned. As an advantage, it's also self-cleaning. It draws fluid up via capillary action and occasionally suction. The tip can narrow to a target mini droplets or splay to cover a wider area. Butterflies are often specialists, meaning that their larvae need to eat a particular plant. So Madam Butterfly better know where to lay her eggs. For when the larvae hatch, they are eating machines, consuming the veggies that mum selected for them. These plants are referred to as host plants. Now we know butterflies have good eyesight, enabling them to find the nectar for the adults to sip. How do they determine what the kids need to eat? Taste receptors are located on a butterfly's feet, allowing them to sample the flavor of the leaf or flower bud prior to laying her eggs. Here are a variety of butterflies that I have seen fluttering by the rancho. The sulfur. These are specialists laying individual eggs on plants in the Senna genus, often called cassia. When I reintroduced these plants to the site, the butterflies came. The larva emerge a bright yellow and then develop stripes before turning green with black dots and one lateral yellow stripe. Using leaves held together with silk, the chrysalis is formed. And when metamorphosis is complete, they hang upside down, unfold their wings to firm up and dry before taking flights. These are active critters and it is a rare treat to photograph one holding still. Of the gossamer wing butterflies, we have only hair streak and blues recorded here. The California hair streak prefers the foothills, yet I have seen them here now and again. Their habitat is oak woodland and chaparral, so our native plants are an important part of the support to this one inch butterfly. Each hind wing has an uneven tail, which is how they got their name hair streak. When the butterfly positions itself facing downward, the combination of the orange eye and the tails can confuse a predator into thinking they are attacking the head. They nectar with their wings closed, reinforcing the subterfuge. A bird's bill might tear a wing, but the butterfly has a real chance of getting away. Oaks are a favorite larval food, so keep your eyes peeled May to August when they emerge to fly and mate. The blues are also tiny creatures. I have seen other blues on site, but the marine blue is consistently in attendance. They love our plumbago, and you will see males flying around one another, gaining in altitude, trying to lead one another away from the plant and the females. Their eggs are laid on flower buds rather than foliage. When the larvae emerge, they eat the flowers as well as the developing seed pods. They are especially fond of legumes, so another great place to observe them is around the Caliandra or Baja Fairy Duster outside the visitor center. Speaking of fairies, 
In Europe, at one time, butterflies were considered to be witches or fairies. As pale yellow butterflies fluttered about pastures where dairy herds grazed, these delicate insects were suspected of trying to steal butter, cream, and milk. Hence, one source for the name butterfly. Rush-footed butterfly. One of the larger groups of butterflies on site, they have shortened forelegs. The arrow is actually pointing to a little orange stripe. That's what I'm talking about. This gives them an appearance of having only four legs. Insects have six. In the brush-footed crew, the female's taste receptors are in hairs on the legs, and many of these migrate. Gulf fritillary are imports from Mexico and the Southeast US. They too are specialists, laying eggs individually on the foliage of passion vine, a fruiting vine with lovely flowers and sometimes delicious fruit. There is a weedy version and the only thing that likes to eat the fruit are the birds, which spread the seeds with professional efficiency. As long as we have this weed, we will be graced by these butterflies. At two to two and a half inches, they are often seen with wings closed, revealing an orange background with silver spots. When the wings are open, clear orange is visible with black markings, cautioning the birds that they are going to be distasteful due to the chemicals consumed with the leaves as a larva. That said, I have seen many a tattered fritillary that have been nipped but got away. The morning cloaks are generalists with egg masses deposited on new leaves and sometimes stems of deciduous trees, particularly willow popular and I suspect black locust. Remember those early butterflies that lived off sap and resin? Morning cloaks still do. It will nectar occasionally, but its primary diet is sap. The males pick a perch where they can watch over their territory and drive off larger butterflies and even hummingbirds. I would like to think that they are social as they are the only butterfly that lands on me regularly, but perhaps they are attracted to the inevitable sap and pitch on me instead. Perched on a tree trunk, their dark wings blend into bark. When they open their wings, they reveal these lovely blue dots just inside the creamy border of their wings. Morning cloaks overwinter, sheltering in loose bark and coming out when the sun shines to warm their wings. West Coast ladies, this is the most common butterfly worldwide. The ones we see locally start in Mexico's deserts and are stopping off here to refuel, showing a preference for native plants. As they migrate north, sometimes as far as the Pacific Northwest, they need all the fuel they can get. They are strong flyers. They also hold the record for the highest altitude for a butterfly. Yet they are often seen low where they have been clocked at 30 miles an hour. In the big flush of rushing wings we experienced in 2019, they were going faster than I was on my commute home, allowing me and other road warriors to break for wayward butterflies that wandered into our lanes. It was a rare sight, but a glowing one, and you saw a lot of smiling commuters. Even with the rate of travel, and possibly because of it, they only live about six weeks. So they fly as far as they can, lay eggs, and the future butterfly finishes the journey. The southbound migration trends smaller, but when that generation hits the deserts, they lay eggs and start the process all over again. When there are super blooms of flowers in the deserts, due to the plentiful and hopeful future rainfall, the emerging larva will have plenty to eat and we can look for another gala of wings to occur. Red admirals come in at around two inches. These striking butterflies favorite host plant is nettles and occasionally baby tears. Capable of multiple broods per year, if the eggs hatch in the winter, the caterpillars will fold a leaf over itself, seal it with silk, and wait for warmer days, entering diapause, an insect version of hibernation. 
If it is the butterfly getting caught in the cold snap, it will shelter in fallen leaves, once again using silk to hold them in place, but will take advantage of any warm weather that occurs. So if you see, so you may well see them flying fast on a fine winter day. The adults also like tree sap and rotting fruit. An entomologist said of red admirals, they may be looked for anywhere, but expected nowhere. When you get to see one, celebrate it. Monarchs are probably the most famous butterfly in California and possibly North America. They, as you may know, are specialists laying eggs on milkweed, with the larva consuming the plants right down to a nub before spinning that iconic chrysalis to morph into the poster child of butterflies. Sadly, they need the attention as their numbers decline due to habitat loss and chemicals. Monarchs started out migrating when populations shifted or were introduced to other continents. A gene called collagen 4A1 evolved in these disparate colonies. The function in their flight muscles changed, increasing the speed of flight at the cost of using more oxygen and increasing their metabolism. This reduces their success at the marathon migrations their ancestors took for granted, so they become residents instead. When they do migrate, they use both solar and magnetic navigation, sometimes soaring well over 100 miles a day, allowing cold fronts when available to push them south. Soaring reduces the amount of energy flapping would consume. And as the migration can be 3,000 miles, every calorie counts. Monarchs are the only butterfly where a single individual flies the entire length of the southerly migration. The northbound journey is multi-generational. Monarchs will eat any milkweed, but some plants can kill them. Tropical milkweed has exploded on the market to fill the demand by the public who want to support monarch populations. Adult monarchs occasionally pick up a protozoan parasite, which can be deposit deposited on the foliage where they lay their eggs. Hatching caterpillars, consuming the foliage will consume the parasite at the same time. This weakens the eventual adult affecting migration and sometimes reproduction. Native milkweeds die back. Mm, all right, sometimes they just die. But the point is, so does the protozoa. Seedlings or new shoots from an established plant are parasite free. If your milkweed does not die back, Cut it to the ground, remove the trimmings, except that you might lose part of a generation, but those that follow are going to be healthier. Adults will stop and sip at many, many nectar rich flowers. The skipper family. These are smaller and chubbier than you would expect a butterfly to be. They tend to be either orange or dull tones that blend in well with tree bark and are often mistaken for moths. 43 species of skippers are found in just Southern California. And of those, six are dusky wings, which usually hang out in oak woodlands. <clears throat> Spread wing skippers are medium size for a skipper, but still small for a butterfly. At rest, they spread their wings out flat. Mournful dusky wing is one of them. These butterflies are hilltoppers. This means that the males perch on the hilltops to watch the girls go by. Their habitat is oak woodlands and coast live oak is their prime food source. These two points, hilltops and oak woodlands, means that while native to our foothills, they have only spread to Long Beach, possibly due to habitat loss and because more oaks are being planted in the urban landscape. Now, no one is going to call this colorful, but they are striking to me as if garbed in formal attire with just a hint of pale lace fringing their hind wings. Eggs are laid individually on young growth, but while fresh tender foliage may be the caterpillar's preference, multiple broods can occur throughout the year. 
When ready to pupate, it will roll up in an oak leaf, secure it with silk and wait for the magic to happen. That last brood, if caught out by winter, will hibernate in the rolled up leaf, emerge with warmer weather beckons to finish eating before rolling himself back up in the next leaf. Oops, gonna go back one more. Uh, separated by the way they hold their wings at rest, they are capable, oh, no, I was right. Sorry about that. These are the grass skippers. And they are separated by the way they hold their wings at rest. Um, they are capable of closing their wings as other butterflies do, but most of the time they jet plane. Jet planing involves maneuvering the hind wings horizontal, the normal pattern, but the fore wings are only partially open, held at an angle betwixt horizontal and vertical, often orange with a variety of markings and under an inch in size. They are highly energetic, skipping from one place to the other. If you have lawns, you probably have fiery skippers. They prefer Bermuda grass, but will accept most turf. Eggs are laid individually on a blade of grass. When the larva hatch, they seek out grass roots using grass blades stitched together with silk for shelter. The brighter color and the spots on the back of the hind wing are clued clues to ID a fiery skipper. The adults are not picky, but often spend time nectaring near lawns. I see them often on lantana and heliotrope. The male will perch to survey for females, who, upon emergence, immediately start shopping for a good nesting territory. They each have glands that secrete pheromones and breeding is year round locally. The umber skipper actually breaks the one inch size by a whole eighth of an inch. It's a darker, duller orange than the fiery skipper and their name umber is apt. Look for the orange to cream spots on the hind wing to help separate it from the more common fiery. An interesting historic note about the umber is that while it was found in Orange County in 1904, it was not found in San Diego, possibly due to the Santa Ana Mountains. The, when the OC population became plentiful during the 1930s and 40s, while the umber only became established in San Diego by the late 1930s. I wonder if that golden age of gardening theme called urban lawns and the increased use of automobiles traveling over the hills may not have played a part in the rise of this little butterfly's territory. The swallowtails. I wanted to save the largest for last. So here's the big finish folks. These projections off their hind wings earned them the moniker swallowtail and trick predators that they into thinking their antennas. With an eye spot nearby to strengthen de the deception. With a butterfly this large, the birds see them and strike. This is a pipe vine butterfly, a rare visitor to Southern California. I have seen a total of three at the rancho in my tenure. All of them tattered, but still stunning in their coloration of black with an iridescent blue hind wing at two and three quarters inch, they truly do stand out. These are specialists laying eggs in bands on pipe vine plants, including California Dutchman's pipe vine. The plant itself is native to Northern California, where there is a modest population of these lovely butterflies. The red eggs hatch and an army of caterpillars move in platoons from leaf remains to the soon to be consumed foliage. Be aware, please, that many exotic pipe vines are so distasteful that while the female may be tricked into laying her eggs, the larva will starve rather than munch a bunch. So plant native. Up in Santa Cruz and Sonoma, they have both managed to reintroduce these lovelies, but San Francisco has done an outstanding job. Since 2012, the population of both the native pipe vine plants and the pipe vine butterfly are increasing. The giant 
butterflies. These are capable of surpassing five inches and are the largest butterfly in the United States and are native to the Southwest. With the introduction of citrus to America, the butterflies found a new favorite food. With the popularity of citrus in home gardens across the southerly states, they were able to expand their territory to find paradise in California, but not until the 1990s. With abundant citrus, their population has grown impressive and irritated the citrus growers, while delighting the home gardeners. These butterflies will lay individual eggs on fresh, tender new growth, and within a week, the larvae are chewing away. Birds don't like their flavor, and the caterpillar has the ability to release a foul smell to deter smaller predators. This doesn't work on wasps and flies, but enough survive that they are now resident here. Look for a large dark brown to black butterfly with a broad or yellow horizontal stripe across its wings. In contrast, the underside of the wing is a bright yellow. Having taken up residence here in SoCal, they have started to evolve. We're talking 1990, this is happening pretty fast folks. And a subspecies has developed. Their wings will be more upright than broad, but they too are lovely to look at. The anise swallowtail. This is a, spe a specialist focused on plants in the carrot family. When sweet fennel was introduced to California by the Spanish colonists in the 1700s, the butterfly added fennel to its diet. As fennel, as fennel was cultivated, it could be found year round and that altered the number of broods the butterfly could raise in a year from one to three. As the fennel is invasive, freely spreading in disturbed earth, habitat was plentiful. Yet the butterfly never seemed to negatively impact the bet fennel. Another plant introduced by the Spanish was the citrus. Also widely planted, yet it was not until 1918 that anise swallowtail was reported feeding on cactus. And get this, they only did so in Southern California. In Chico up in the Sacramento Valley, it was not until the 1960s that they were reported to be expanding their buffet table to include citrus. It turns out that the essential oils on the foliage of both plants acts as a feeding stimuli to the caterpillar. Yet, if given a choice, the female will choose fennel over citrus every time. To protect orchards, farmers could plant fennel and not have to bring in toxic poisons. The three inch adult has racing stripes down the thorax and the abdomen and a lovely stained glass pattern to its wings. And it too is a hilltopper as previously described. Once abundant at the Rancho, I see it less these days. It's possible that the giant is somehow putting pressure on them. We still have fennel in the herb garden, so they are welcome to eat as much as they like. The Western Tiger Swallowtail falls between the giant and the anise in size, capable of exceeding three inches. This butterfly is different by having vertical stripes, and it is these that garnered it the name tiger. With striking blue eyes spots right above the tails, it is a really lovely addition to the garden scene. It does not limit its stripes to the wings, but sports them on the abdomen and the thorax as well. A male will follow a watercourse cruising canyons both near the water and at the hilltops looking for the girls. More of a generalist, she will lay individual eggs on the undersides of the leaves of sycamores, poplars, willows, and alders, all naturally native to riparian areas. The larva spins silken mats and will shelter in curled leaves. They will nectar on butterfly bush, lantana, and a variety of plants in the daisy family, and socially congregate to puddle at muddy spots as they access the liquefied minerals, much like their early ancestors. When the next time at the rancho, take a deep breath, and as you let it out, open your eyes to all the treasures the site offers. 
And may you find a respite from turmoil and be renewed in the moment and beyond. Tessa, you're up, but we have to ask if there's any questions first. Should I stop my share? I can stop my share. Okay. Any questions? I just have to comment, Marie. Great presentation. I can't wait for a butterfly to land on me now. <laughs> Keep still. So this is good. Thank you, Marie. <laughs> my pleasure. All right. I guess if there are no questions, then it will, we will pass it over to Tessa. Thank you, Marie. I was giving everybody a, a couple of minutes just to process through that beauty. I have to say it's so enjoyable to think about the little world that exists next to ours as we're running around and, you know, worrying about other things. And um, there's real life and death and evolution <laughs> happening on our site every day. There is. I didn't actually put in the death part. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I picked up on it. <laughs> something had to be cut <laughs> so a lifespan was one of them <laughs> well thank you very much i'm going to give just a quick funding update on some other things that have been happening allison shared um you know our fabulous uh rivers and mountains conservancy news with the 2.1 million dollar grant earlier in the presentation. Um, one thing I don't want to pass by without mentioning is we also received notification from NEH, which is the National Endowment for the Humanities, that we're receiving a $77,000 grant to support our next exhibit, Raices uh, de Long Beach. Did I hear it has an updated name now? Raices to Southern California. <laughs> okay. That's Southern California now, yes. That is hot off the presses. Um, and so that's a grant, you know, NEH is a funder that we have been pursuing at least in, in my time at the Rancho and I'm celebrating four years this month. Uh, so that was really remarkable to get that news. And I wanna just make sure to highlight um, the NEH grant that we got as well. Um, additionally, I'd like to give you an update on Long Beach Gives, which took place last month. Um, Long Beach Gives is the city of Long Beach's um, citywide digital day of giving. Several Long Beach-based foundations came together about three years ago to do a coordinated effort uh, to get nonprofits to work together and to really get the whole city of Long Beach involved and enthusiastic about philanthropy. So the Rancho has participated um, in each of the three years that this, that this digital event has been happening. It started off in year one as just a grouping of about 30 nonprofits. In year two, it was about 75 nonprofits. And this year, it was more than 200 Long Beach-based nonprofits participating, which is just remarkable. And uh, the city came together. And when I say the city, I mean individuals and foundations um, came together and donated more than $200 to $200, two million dollars to, to the 200 organizations that were participating. That was too many twos. <laughs> so um, the Rancho's approach this year was what we decided to do because this is a true peer-to-peer um, -peer fundraising type of an event where uh, you're encouraged as an individual to sign up to do your own giving page. And we've done that in all of the years and it's been a lot of fun, but we took a different approach this year. And what we um, did instead was created teams. And so uh, for instance, our board of directors had a team page. And so everyone on the board 
was working to fund that page and working together as a team. I know that um, a group of our garden volunteers created a page to support Long Beach Gives and they were promoting that page. And so I'm just thrilled to announce that all together we raised more than $17,000 which with this effort, um, which was just incredible because we had a $10,000 goal. Uh, we received an anonymous $5,000 match, which was very helpful and we're very grateful for. And the feedback that I've received is that um, folks really enjoyed this team approach and it felt like a great way to work together, um, to be supportive of one another's giving efforts and, um, and we succeeded and did a great job. The other thing that happened with Long Beach Gives, besides just the um, actual giving that supports the Rancho. And the story we told, by the way, um, focused on the Rancho's gardens. So this is a perfect segue with the butterflies, Marie. Um, but the other thing that happened is the nonprofit partnership, which is sort of the hub for this digital day of giving, they decided to do a kickoff event this year where all of the participating nonprofits could gather together in one place in person um, to celebrate and share ideas and network. And so the nonprofit partnership reached out to the Rancho and chose the Rancho as the host site. And I was thrilled uh, to be chosen. And so we had, um, I think all in all, more than 100 attendees came that Monday before the Thursday, which was the actual Long Beach Gives Giving Day. Um, and so I spoke to my counterpart at MOLA and the aquarium, and um, it, was a, it was a great program. And I think people were thrilled to be in person and see each other. And the other thing that it does, um, because it's wonderful to get these groups together, but the other thing it does is it really highlights the Rancho as a beautiful outdoor space that supports all of the nonprofits in Long Beach. And throughout the last year and a half, um, this, this COVID time period, the Rancho has worked extremely hard to be available to other nonprofits. So, I mean, just to name a few, New Hope Grief, Leadership Long Beach, Junior League of Long Beach, um, Maple Village Waldorf School, I know I'm missing another dozen nonprofits, have all used the Rancho in one way or another for meetings, board retreats, and their community programming. So we've been very, very honored to help other nonprofits continue their programming. Uh, so, you know, as much as possible, they didn't have an interruption in their community service as well. So for everyone that participated in Long Beach Gives this year, it was just an absolute pleasure to put together and to talk to all of you and strategize about how to do it this year. And, um, and I just wanna thank you very much. Any questions related to Long Beach Gives? before I hand it off to Megan or the NEH grant as well, which is more great news. I think Martin and Joyce have a question, so I'm gonna allow them to talk. Uh, no, no question. Thanks. All right, the hand was up, but there we go. Tessa, thank you for that um, update. It's really fun to hear um, about things that are going on. I know my mom said she got a thank you letter and was delighted to, to have um, that. Let's see, I finally have an education update because we're doing some programming coming up. Uh, one thing we, as many of you know, we had garden docent training virtual and those docents are checking out, woohoo. I think most of them have actually checked out by this point. Uh, and now, as promised, we're going into house docent training. Uh, this is also a virtual training program. It's on Tuesdays. It actually started earlier today. So from 2 to 4.30 on Tuesdays, um, we're doing that. But even if you missed it, we can catch you up. And um, that's possible because these, mess these meetings are being recorded. Um, so let Laura know or sign up in Logistics if you're interested in that. It'll be going on through late November, um, and then we'll have an in-class meeting um, to, to show what you're learning. 
Uh, we also, we've been doing story time since the summer, but we added last Saturday bilingual story time. Um, so we do regular story times, preschool sort of oriented on Tuesdays, every Tuesday at 10. Um, bilingual story time is in English and Spanish, and that'll be on the third Saturday also at 10, primarily in the backyard or wherever a special event is not taking place. So we have a little flexibility going on there since we are open to the public at that time, but we had about a dozen people on site for that last week. We couldn't figure out how to do um, our traditional creation station in person because the whole point of that is gathering together and sharing art supplies and uh, really engaging with the Rancho. We want people to engage. We want them to have fun. We want them to learn a little bit, um, but we're going to use, uh, we started last Saturday, virtual technology to make that happen so kids um, or their parents can come pick up a craft bag for the first two weeks of the month. And then on the third Saturday um, at 1 p.m., we are doing a uh, creation station live on Facebook. And Alana is our hostess for that. So it's pretty awesome. Uh, end of the month, if you know kids, uh, elementary through eight, uh, sorry, 18. So, so uh, K-12 educators, um, K-12 education participants, that is students are encouraged to come. We ask that they sign up in advance but we're having a, an event called Kids Draw Architecture. And what that is, is a local chapter of um, the American Institute of Architects uh, is um, sending nine different uh, architects to help children learn to sketch architecture. They've done this at several Long Beach libraries and technically they're doing it at yet another one, but also, uh, as you know, the interesting architecture of Rancho Los Cerritos uh, is hiding a library, but it is the rancho itself that these um, trained architects will be showing children how to draw. So if you know uh, elementary, middle, or high school kids that might want to participate, tell them to sign up. Finally, we are planning for the holidays. Um, we will, uh, we hope, be able to offer an after hours, primarily outdoor, uh, tour, um, uh, an after hours holiday experience um, on December 12th and 19th. And there are a good group of about a dozen Rancho volunteers, uh, mostly docents, many of them living history docents who are helping uh, us plan this. If you would like to get involved, all you have to do is sign up on Volgistics and we'll send you the link for tomorrow evening's meeting. The next meeting is tomorrow at 530, even if you don't help plan it you can participate. We will have many costumed roles. We will have some non-costumed roles. We will have some people in costumes who don't necessarily speak to the um, visitors. So there are costume roles of non-living history docents. So take your pick. We'd love to have you involved. Just let Laura know if you can't participate tomorrow, um, but would like to be involved, just send her an email. If you can participate, we'll send you a link for tomorrow's meeting. Laura, it's up to you. But Laura, I think you're on mute. Sorry, um, I had to hang up on Laura Salazar who was watching it through my iPhone. That's why I was holding my phone up like that. So um, yes, hello everyone. Um, thank you for coming and it's time for us all to come together and my prompt for this week after uh, Allison told us about our master plan is what do you have in your personal master plan for the next few years in your life? Um, so let's, um, we'll promote you so we can see you all and um, you can think about what you um, have in your master plan. So hold on, it'll look like you're leaving, but you'll come back and we'll see you all.
Hmm. Some people are just unpromotable. They can still type into the chat, even if we can't get them promoted, but I will continue to work on it while Laura tells us her strategic master plan for the next, or at least one thing from it. I would call it her bucket list. Oh, well, I, it's more like a master plan. Uh, my master plan is to be able to plan and attend and make my daughter's wedding be a success next year. So I think that's, that's a big plan for me. So that's what's on my master plan. Um, so let me pass it off to, well, let me introduce to you a new volunteer that this will be her first uh, visit here to a virtual gathering. She just started volunteering this past month. And uh, well, hopefully I don't see her face, but hopefully she can participate. Esther, are you able to um, share your video or audio? So you could share your master plan or bucket list. Maybe not. Wait, wait, here she comes. She moved. Yes, there she is. <laughs> Hi, Esther. Sorry to put you on the spot, but I thought it would be a good chance to introduce you to everybody. Esther uh, works in the garden and she is uh, worked for public hours and she even signed up for house docent training. She's a master gardener. Um, we see you, but you still have to unmute yourself, Esther. Get it. Okay. There you All go. right. Oh my goodness. I, I couldn't make this work on my computer earlier. So I'm doing it on my iPhone <laughs> and it, it's working. Uh, master plan. I think my my nearest goal is I'm I'm planning. I'm going to Fiji to see my daughter who lives there. She has been quarantined there for two years. And so I haven't gotten there yet. So I'm excited to be uh, doing that right after Christmas. Going to go visit with her. And of course, I want to keep working in the, you know, in the garden. I love it. <laughs> Wonderful. So now you get to look at the screen and uh, pick uh, somebody else to pass the mic to. Oh my goodness. I don't know that I can do that. Let's see here. Oh, heck. Um, uh, oh, participants. Okay. So somebody, all right. Okay. I, I think I chose Donald. Does, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, did that work? Well, no. Uh, yeah. Donald heard oh my gosh. him to unmute himself and uh, share his screen. But I think Donald's there. We've okay. definitely seen him on uh, these virtual gatherings before. Um, and he's the one who took me on my, my well, he's doing that when I uh, did my um, training. He's the one that took me through the garden. And I just want to say what a fantastic job he did as garden docent. Absolutely. He I don't know about job. that, but yes. Um, <laughs> well, okay. welcome. It's great to have new people. We need we need more docents, so that's good. My master plan, I guess, is to finally travel. Moved here three years ago and wanted to see all of the great spots in California, and coronavirus virus changed that. So. Um, yeah, looking forward to finally getting out, taking some trips. We have an older cat, so that the only wrinkle now is finding a good cat sitter. So if anyone in the group wants to house and cat sit, let me know. And who will you pass it off the mic to, Donald? Excuse me? Who would you like to pass the mic to? Oh, let me see. How about Thomas Heaton? Okay. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, I started off with uh, the year with renovating the house uh, out, outside. Uh, 
it's almost 100 years old. And when we moved in 35 years ago, we did a lot of renovation, but it was time uh, getting rid of termites and replacing wood and still keeping up with the uh, architectural integrity of it all and uh, new arbors and stuff like that. So now it's to tackle the backyard, uh, bricking that in and using the, um, the rancho as kind of a, a base as having the uh, Palo Verde stone along with the, uh, the uh, brick and everything like that. So I'm, I'm doing little copies of, of that too. So I can have my own little rancho within the big rancho. <laughs> <laughs> and, if, and if possible, um, I'd love to get back to Europe again and uh, we'll see how that goes. But uh, uh, that's, that's the plan for the rest of the year. So, so now I think I will choose, how about uh, Ina? Okay, so my husband and I ballroom dance and we've been doing it for several years, but we've yet to really master the salsa. So one of my goals, maybe bucket list items is to get really good at the salsa. It's a very fast dance and we're not very fast people, <laughs> but it takes a lot of time and a lot of practice. And actually we got started with it and then the pandemic came and all, but we're back to dance lessons and so last week we spent about 20 minutes on it and that was plenty, but maybe a year from now, I'll be able to do the salsa and feel really confident about it. So I'd like to do that. So I have to pick someone else, huh? Okay. How about Linda? You're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Am I the one that you called on? I am, yes. All right. Um, I got started late because I got tied up in listening to Marie's online uh, presentation for the garden docents, which I'm trying to, to work on. Um, I don't know, my, my personal goals are probably just to get through each week and try to do something useful and maybe learn something, but I have, I thought you said a personal goal for the rancho, and I do have a personal goal for the rancho, and then that is to see that the um, night, the uh, eighteen seventy six, whatever, that the old parlor does come back in some form or other, because after all, Susan without a parlor to get married in, you know, that leaves her in a rather a precarious state, and we would not have have an unmarried Susan going over to the other rancho to live in sin with John. So um, yes, to keep things appropriate, I guess that's my goal for the rancho. My personal goal, I don't know how appropriate, but to keep moving. And uh, let's see, I will turn it over to the Phillips. For myself. Oh. Speaking for myself, I actually don't have any big goals. I was thinking I feel like sort of like one of Marie's butterflies in a cocoon after a year and a half of being punched up and now I'm trying to dry out my wings. But since we've already been to Cambria twice and Ireland once this year, I guess my wings are dry. So now I'm just trying to uh, see what's next. You know, so many, many things have changed in the last year and a half and just going on, doing what I'm doing, trying to get back to things and, and get back to the ranch some more. And um, so hopefully that will all work out now that my wings are dry. Oh, and I guess I'm next. Uh, yeah, I I like the travel part, especially to Ireland. I don't see my grandchildren. Uh, and son and his grandchildren. I like that a lot, but but our grandchildren. Not him. <laughs> not mine. I don't have any kids. But anyway, uh, one of the things I'm interested in getting back into was the ship culture. Somehow finding a way to make it work the not necessarily the way it was, but but in a way that meant presented very well. And 
also there's uh, some other things I'd like to look at regarding the uh, negatives that we have to look at for a long time. The two negatives in the new concentration to make sure that we get a good product out of it. And I guess that's about it. How students, you know, all, all sorts of things to do around the house. It's on a regular basis. You'd like me to pass it on to somebody? Now, who would be left? I mean, some of the staff people are they involved in this? Yeah. Esther, Esther Taylor? Well, Esther went first. Um, oh, yeah. The Zadakas are here. Joy Sadaka. Boy. Here she comes. We have to promote it today. Uh -huh. Okay. We can hear you, Joy and Hiam, if you, uh, we can't. Oh, thank you. Okay. Unfortunately, we couldn't hear anything that uh, Floyd said. <laughs> we really would have been interested. Um, for myself, I just want to get through this pandemic healthy and able to make plans that we can carry out. We have a lot of things to do around the house and the yard, and we would like to do some traveling too. That's right. So there are a lot of projects that we have to start uh, taking on. And of course, we look forward to participating more fully at the Rancho maskless <laughs> safely <laughs> okay we gotta take somebody else let me see who hasn't had a chance yet hold on um looks like most people have oh have either participated or gone um no on our screen i don't see anyone who hasn't is it put your hand up if you hadn't had a chance yet <laughs> we're people too marie why don't you go Did you call on me, Megan? Well, I am nothing if not persistent. Um, in 2019, my big goal was to move from my wonderful flip phone that has lasted since 2006 to a smartphone. And then I had to have some, I had some medical bills that had to get paid. 2020, my goal was to get a smartphone. And then I got a new car instead. <laughs> 2021, <laughs> um, my smartphone, which continues to function, but is no longer being supported. The 3G network means that when I call 911, when I'm on the freeway, uh, I break up and they can't, they can't hear where, what, what I'm trying to report. So my big goal is I'm hoping that this year I will get a smartphone. <laughs> um, Alana, why don't you go? My goal is for you to get a smartphone so you can call 911. <laughs> um, I think my whole life, whenever I've thought about a bucket list, it's always just been all the places I want to travel. Um, and so I want to travel uh, pretty much everywhere. I, I would love to hit all seven continents, um, probably not in the next five years, but before um, my butterfly life cycle ends. Um, and, uh, my boyfriend and I are sort of like tentatively planning post pandemic, um, to go to Japan. So that's, um, what I've been doing. And I took Japanese in high school, but had forgotten a lot, but I've been using the Duolingo app to try and remember some of it. So get more, get better at Japanese would also be on there, I guess. Uh, and then Megan, I think you're, you're left. <laughs> Uh, well, I want to go. My pre-pandemic desire is my post-pandemic desire, and I want to see as many presidential libraries as I can. I just find them such an interesting slice of Americana. I've visited a number of them, but not in a methodical way. It's just whenever I'm anywhere close, like within the same state, I will make my way there. So. Uh, I have a, my older son will be moving to North Carolina, so I have a whole new region of the country to visit. Um, 
So starting next summer, maybe. And that will be my goal. I would just want to go like you, Joy, visit places in person without a mask because it's safe and feels best. But a particular kind of visit. Laura, back to you. Okay, well, um, that is um, about it. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, little wrap up of things we have coming up. Uh, tomorrow night, we have the planning, the Zoom planning meeting for, um, for the holiday after hours tour. So if you wanna be part of that, um, please um, sign up for it. And I'll be sending out that link tomorrow because I haven't done that yet. So yes, I will do that tomorrow. Um, I hope um, some people will want to sign up for curatorial uh, opportunities. We, um, Carlos has a lot of stuff on his plate and I hope that some of our volunteers that have been doing curatorial can um, sign up for some of the things that we need done. We have to move um, the archives. Uh, on November 1st and 2nd, and I have that up on um, Vlogistics. And um, those are the main ones I'm thinking about. So um, thank you all for coming. Is there anything that I should mention that I'm forgetting, Megan? I think Next time's volunteer gathering is gonna feature one of our own, volunteer Brian Chavez, who has also been an itinerant staff member on occasion, but works at the Historical Society currently, but he also finished his degree in history, a master's degree in history recently. And he is gonna talk to us in conjunction with Veterans Day, more or less, just after. Um, about the experience of Spanish speaking people during the Civil War. So this will really expand what um, many of us know. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, if we can do it in person, we will. If we need to do it online, we will. But uh, Brian is, I'm excited to have him uh, grace us with his presence and his knowledge. Yes, I'm very excited too. I think a lot of volunteers remember uh, he's the one that he the summer before COVID, he baked us some uh, bread pudding in the Orno, and that was a huge hit with volunteers. And I think you'll really enjoy his presentation uh, next month, too. So I think that wraps it up. If you're watching this uh, recorded, please remember to log your volunteer hours. And um, I'll see you around the rancho. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.